Hi fellow book lovers and welcome back to another video. Today I would like to talk about Miyako Kawakami's All the Lovers in the Night. I am currently filming this at around 9pm because I thought it fit the mood. Also, I whipped out my prettiest blue t-shirt, the only blue t-shirt that I own, <laughs> just to honor this book. Because I found it truly amazing. Like, I love this book. First things first, two disclaimers. First disclaimer. I don't recommend watching this video if you have not read All the Lovers in the Night. I do want to discuss some aspects and talk about the story. Um, and I did consider doing that spoiler free, but while I was writing the text and writing about the things that I felt were important, I just realized that I couldn't do that without talking about spoilers. So this is more of a video for people who have already read it and kind of want to discuss the book, which is connected to disclaimer number two. I am not a literary expert. Everything I say is my personal interpretation, my personal opinion, um, based on what I've read and some research. I know that this is redundant for some people, but I feel like this is something I need to put on here. Just to make clear, I am human. I am not immune to failure, so please make up your own mind. And whatever interpretation you have, I think it's valid as well. Um, and there is nothing, you know, this is a book. <laughs> Okay, now that you and I are both set on the fact that I can always be wrong, <laughs> let's talk about All the Lovers in the Night. So, Skeleton First, All the Lovers in the Night is a novel originally published in 2011 in Japan. This version, the English version, got translated by Sam Bat and David Boyd and was only published this year. It is said to be part of a loosely connected trilogy. Part of this trilogy are Heaven, which was originally released in 2009, and Breasts and Eggs, which was published as a short novella in 2008. And then Kawakami rewrote everything, she only kept the characters and places, and Breasts and Eggs was then published as the version you see here in 2019. Um, I'm not sure if the English translation is from 2019, I think it's actually 2020, so not this exact version. Yeah, 2020. Now this trilogy is called Loosely Connected, um, because you can read each book individually and it's its own story, but somehow the themes are repeating itself, at least with some of the books. Um, we have Heaven, which is focusing on moral issues. It's talking more on like the morals behind what is good and evil, but also about power and how fragile power is and what power actually means and that we actually don't have power since even the most powerful person um, can't defeat death. <laughs> I think if I got this right. Anyways, this is more of a discussion, as I said, around moral topics. Also, the only book that is featuring um, the perspective of a male protagonist. And then Breasts and Eggs is talking about the topic of femininity, of womanhood in Japan. And there are two parts in this. And the first part is about the female body and how it is viewed and like all the things that come with it. And then the second part is on um, having a child and what it means to be a parent, uh, what it means to raise a child and if you can do that by yourself without a man. And All the Lovers in the Night does take on, on the topics of breasts and eggs, but it does discuss this femininity and womanhood in a sort of different way. While in Breasts and Eggs, Kawakami is talking about these topics in a very straightforward way. All the Lovers in the Night is more nuanced and more subtle. What I ultimately love about Kawakami's writing though, and I think that is something she does in all three of her books, is that she never pushes her opinion on the reader. She basically just simply describes scenarios um, and characters and lets the reader decide for themselves whether they think that that is a good decision or a bad decision or right and wrong. Let's talk about the plot. So we are following Fuyuki Irie, who is a mid 30 year old independent proofreader who is struggling with feelings of isolation. This is not only due to her work, which she does from home, but also due to her very timid personality. But one day, accidentally, she meets a man who's called Mitsutsuka and who just doesn't want to leave her head. So when you hear me talking about the plot, 
in this way, it sounds like a love story. But to call this a romance or a love story just does not do this book any justice. Because this theme is only one part of the entire book, only one part of Ilia, and the romance does not devour the other contents of the book. What I found to be much more in the center of the story was Ilia's loneliness, so to say. So she works from home, as I said, she doesn't really have friends, she doesn't really go out. Uh, and one day she decides to change that. So she decides to take up a class in a culture center. And at that culture center there are loads of loads of classes that she can choose to take in order to like get herself out there and just, you know, get to know some people. And because I think that the scene of her being at this culture center to sign up for a class is a very very important scene because it features a lot of topics that are important to the story overall i would like to talk further on it so all of the contents that i'm going to discuss are located at the beginning of the fourth chapter which starts in this edition on page 56 and there are a couple of themes that come together so first of all we have her wanting to fight her loneliness fight like her feeling of not knowing what to do with herself um finding a new interest knowing like what she actually likes and what she dislikes and what she wants in life oh my god second of all we have her struggling with taking action she's struggling with deciding which courses to take because she does not have interests she feels like she's a person that is a, a blank canvas and we kind of see this in her choosing courses or classes based on external criteria such as like commitment or task descriptions and then she settles on choosing between five classes that have nothing in common with each other so you clearly see it's just her trying to figure out what might could be of interest to her then also thirdly because remember this is a list we also see her struggling with social anxiety so we see her struggling with the thought of putting herself out there of being judged by others and we see this on one hand by her choosing classes that don't require any movement or that don't require her showing her work to others but also on the other hand we see it shown through her relationship with alcohol which is just a tool a utensil for her in order to be able to go outside and and even meet people so on a page a little bit before she visits the culture center she says over time with the aid of just one can of beer drunk slowly or a single cup of sake i developed the ability to let go of my usual self so this alcohol it's it's a utensil it just helps her escaping herself even her going to the cultural center was initially a wet idea and then number four of the elements that are discussed in those two pages um i think we finally for the first time get introduced to light in the combination with Mitsutsuka. So I could be mistaken, but as far as I thought, the first time that Iria actually talks about the link between positivity, happiness and light uh, is when she's in this cultural center. And if you read the book, you will have noticed that Iria is commenting on the weather multiple times throughout the book. So we have, for example, before that, in May, um, very unpredictable weather. And then in June or July, I'm sorry, I, I don't remember correctly, but June or July, it's very rainy. And then she talks about this, not the weather, but light, in the culture center, by saying, the place was crowded, but it was bright. The atmosphere was nice and I didn't hate being there. And she talks about brightness, light, and stuff like that, um, also, in relationship to the weather when she for example says she likes summer because of the light and when it's rain and it's clouded it usually also is pretty dark and you can't really see a lot of lights so i thought that this was connected and i thought it was very very important that at least for the first time that i noticed it um it it was in this situation because it was shortly before she was going to meet mitsutsuka And these two events, like meeting Mitsutsuka for the first time, but also connecting light to happiness, at least as far as to, as to my knowledge, I feel like it's important that they are close to each other, but that they are not causally related. Because this further underlines the fact that the man that she meets is not the reason for her happiness. It's her taking initiative and actually doing something about her own life. So this is my own interpretation, obviously, but I thought it was 
there and I thought it was brilliant. Nonetheless, like by saying this, I don't want to diminish the importance that Mitsutsuka has uh, for Iria. Like he becomes one of the two most important people for her. He gets a very special role as he introduces her to new topics, especially talking about the physical properties of light, as he says to be um, a physics teacher at a high school. But also he introduces her to some music, uh, like Chopin for example. And so she kind of discovers new things um, and new interests through him. So it's sort of also falling in love with the idea of finally having something of interest to you. So Irie completely forgets about um, the classes that she wanted to take on. Uh, but loses herself in the connection to Mitsutsuka somehow. I want to stay on the topic of light for a little bit longer just because I think it's very important in the story. So I feel like every time that we see a passage about light in this book it does have a certain message that it tries to convey. Like, for example, isn't it really interesting that the way that uh, Iria and Mitsutsuka talk about light, it's always from the physical angle, they are always talking about like the uh, like the circumstances, the very scientific uh, approach to light. And I mean, wacky interpretations number two, but I feel like through talking about only this like framework of light, only the scaffolding of it, like to have Mitsutsuka, it's important. Don't get me wrong. Um, but this relationship between them, it's kind of missing emotion and it's kind of missing some depth to it. I just felt like this was reflected in the way that they talked and in the way that they like had conversation around those topics and then oftentimes they were also very silent like they were just um, sitting in the in the coffee shop not talking which is totally fine but I, I just thought that this was interesting. Thoughts, thoughts, please give me your thoughts if you have any on this because this is like straight straight from the dumpster here. But let's talk about the other aspects of the light in him. The book ends, and this is why I say this contains spoilers, because I want to talk about this. The book ends at night. So, um, in winter, in December, at night. But when you read this, you immediately know that it's a positive ending. And why do you know that? Because Iria is focusing on the lights in the night. Like, even though it is night, while she walks home, Iria focuses on the stars, on the moon, on the car lights, on lit windows that she passes. Like, she's not really paying attention to the dark here. And this is almost brought to a comedically obvious level when she closes the book with saying, now that the light was gone, I closed my eyes softly, knowing it would only be a short time until the light came back in the morning. So you see, this is such a positive ending and so poetic. <laughs> Although arguably, like, this is not the most deep poetry. It still, it still is poetic. You know, having the sun being linked to positivity and happiness is sort of an obvious connection, but by having some of the topics of the book being about female compliance and like living a life that is expected from you, I found this kind of analogy super interesting where like we shift from the light of the sun to the lights of the night and that maybe might perhaps also saying that you don't have to take the most obvious choice in order to be happy. I know, I know. <laughs> Maybe that's a reach, but... <laughs> discussion, people, discussion. <laughs> we can all share our thoughts. Okay, let's talk about another aspect which I feel like is heavily in focus in this book, and that is solitude, as I've already mentioned. Iria is quite a lonely person. I think in order to understand Iria's loneliness a bit better, we kind of need to look at Hijiri. Okay, Hijiri. Hijiri is Iria's co-worker. Um, she's the reason why Iria has a job that she has. She helped her getting independent um, and getting this job because Hijiri genuinely think, thinks that Iria is um, 
a hard worker and a very virile worker and she respects what she's doing. She also tells Iria that she thinks she's different from other women because of the way that she approaches her work. Both of those characters, I tell you, could not be any more different. They are literal opposites of each other. But what is so fascinating about this to me is that they are both alone in their own respective ways. So Hijiri is not afraid to rub people the wrong way with her personality. She's not afraid to stand up for herself um, or speak up on topics that are important to her. She also, contrary to Iria, has a lot of lovers. Um, she's like very out there. She, she really has no problem with confrontation, but because of her personality, because she's not considered to be a good Japanese woman, um, she's also getting ostracized, just like Iria. Uh, in her case, it's due to her actions. In Iria's case, it's due to her inaction. And Hijri is the target of a lot of criticism, especially by other women. But through this very unique kind of loneliness that both of them experience, they seem to find friendship and a connection with each other. Which even goes so far, by the way, that at one point Iria is even dressing up in Hijiri's clothes. So you see her really trying to act like Hijiri, like trying to be out, outgoing, trying to do things that she wouldn't normally do, like leave her own self behind. Another thing that I noticed that I feel like I can link to breasts and eggs is Hijiri's position of being a sort of role model to Iria. So for example, there is a famous author in Breasts and Eggs, which also serves as a role model for our protagonist, who like decides to just bring up a child by her herself. That gets revisited in All the Lovers in the Night, when Hijri in the end is also deciding to like raise a child for herself. And I think that Kawakami uses this sort of decision of being a single mother to suggest strength or a strong woman, like somebody facing the backlash of society, saying like she can't do that on her own, um, and just telling them no, <laughs> no, you, you can. Um, I'm a strong woman, I'm independent, and I can definitely raise a child on my own. I don't need a man. J just a thought. Putting it all out there. Okay, to complete this mess of a conversation around the book, I would just want to give you my final thoughts. Um, I thought that All the Lovers in the Night was astonishingly beautifully written. I think that, I believe that this is my favorite book um, that I've read by Kawakami so far. And I think that that has something to do with the sort of nuanced way and subtle way that it was talking about its topics. I will say that because of this subtlety, it is very easy for a reader to overread certain certain things. When I closed the book, I immediately felt like I could reread this. I just wanted to see like how the whole thing would change with sort of understanding um, what the themes were. And in that, I thought this was extremely similar to the feeling that I have whenever I read Ishiguro's works. They are different, they are not comparable, but um, the way that like craftsmanship went into this, I felt like, wow, this is so well constructed. I love this feeling. I love seeing a book being well written. <laughs> I can't help it. And also it was so so beautiful that I had to cry. Um, I think twice. <laughs> I don't never cry at books but it's once a year something like that. Um, and this book did that to me so it was really really beautiful is all I'm trying to say here. So I'm gonna end my talk now. The only thing that was left for me in my wacky brain to say is thank you so much for watching and I'll see you at another time in another video. Bye!